you be? Hi, everyone. <laughs> Synthony Partano here, the internet's busiest music nerd, and it's time for a classic review of this Gorillaz album, Demon Days. This is the second full-length LP from virtual band Gorillaz. It came out in 2005. The group features Murdoch, Noodle, 2D, and Russell. Or at least those are the characters that have long represented the multimedia project that was actually founded by producer, singer, and songwriter Damon Albarn, along with illustrator Jamie Hewlett. And it's funny, thinking of gorillas, it often comes along with a super cohesive and immersive vision that only somebody of Jamie Hewlett's caliber could imagine the depth of. But behind the curtain, what Gorillaz actually is and continues to be is this hodgepodge of totally unlikely collaborators, completely nonsensical worlds colliding. But I guess that's just what was destined for this band considering it started because uh, the lead singer of Blur and the creator of Tank Girl somehow knew each other. Like, imagine if a band was created because Stan Lee and uh, Eddie Vedder were friends. It makes no sense. But still, Hewlett and Albarn would go on to have this breakout single, which also involved an unlikely pairing as it featured one of the most underrated West Coast rappers of all time, Del the Funky Homo Sapien. But I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. I'll say this, I vividly remember Gorillaz making cultural waves back in the day, and they arrived at an interesting time. This project was ahead of the curve, but simultaneously, I couldn't really imagine it taking off during any other time than the final years of the music music video era. There are aspects of it that remind me of uh, offbeat music videos from the 90s or uh, animation from the liquid television era, but then also there's something about gorillas that feels very proto-internet culture too, and shares parallels to the weird underbelly of flash animation culture at the time. As good creative and unique as gorillas was when they dropped onto the scene, uh, there were a lot of people that didn't really know how quite to take them at the time. For years, I remember seeing uh, CD copies of their debut album uh, just infesting used bins, as I'm sure a lot of people maybe going into that record having heard only Clint Eastwood uh, would have expected, I guess, more of a, a rap pop blend across the entire thing. Maybe a lot more Del the Funky Homo Sapien too. But instead what they got on this record was this very odd blend of alt rock, trip hop, hip hop, and a bit of punk. It was not the most cohesive listen for sure, and uh, there was at least some level of perception uh, that Gorillaz was essentially just a gimmick that would ultimately be short-lived. But several years down the road, these guys would come back around again and uh, give it another shot, attempting to improve everything having to do with gorillas on all fronts. The songwriting, the visuals, the lore, even the features. And I think Albarn and Hewlett did exactly the right thing, taking cues directly from the tracks and moments off the last record that uh, seemed to resonate with people the most and just build off of that. With the genre blends, the super cartoony and synthy production that made tracks like 19 2000 so incredible. Also standout performances from a variety of collaborators too. I think producer Dan the Automator was obviously a very pivotal in crafting that kind of vibe for the first record. And Albarn took a really big risk in moving away from Dan to uh, work with other people for Demon Days. Most notably a man who at the time was like enemy number one in the music industry. Of course, I'm talking about Danger Mouse, AKA Brian Burton, a producer, songwriter, and multi-instrumentalist who uh, today is known for being a hit maker for people who are pretty safe bets. Uh, James Mercer, CeeLo, his recent record with Black Thought was super well received too. But at the time when he was brought on to work on Demon Days, he didn't have those accolades. Really the most well-known thing about him at the time was this remix project he had put out where he mixed together uh, acapellas from Jay-Z's Black Album with uh, beats and instrumentals that were cobbled together from a variety of Beatles tracks. It was called The Grey Album, and it created quite the commotion in the music industry. It was virally popular. It pissed off EMI. There were cease and desists. This thing was copied and printed and downloaded and uh, on a few occasions sold. And the controversy around this record uh, 
did unfortunately lead to Burton being kind of blackballed in uh, a lot of the music industry. However, there were clearly artists who were big fans of uh, what he was doing, uh, Damon Albarn being one of them. And as a result, he pretty much goes from that to working on one of the greatest records of the 2000s, as well as producing beats for an Adult Swim-themed hip-hop record, Danger Doom, that would feature MF Doom, uh, but that's kind of a different story. But this proves that the magic of Gorillaz uh, is really in this veil of a fake band that allows there to be total fluid creativity behind, you know, that facade. Because as long as audiences are seeing these four characters that they always see, whatever the hell Damon wants or Hewlett wants can kind of go on in the background. Which means you could produce all kinds of different tracks and bring on the likes of Nena Cherry, Booty Brown from the far side, uh, MF Doom again, Rock Pioneer, Ike Turner as well, just to name a few. And they all add to multiple career-defining moments on this record. Look, it's important to note this expanding roster of collaborators on Demon Days because this is something that would uh, go on to snowball uh, with future Gorillaz albums as the project would go on to uh, bring on more and more and more collaborators, sometimes successfully, sometimes not as successfully. But either way, it's grown to the point where Gorillaz has become uh, like an institution of sorts where landing on one of their tracks is like a cool rite of musical passage. And we don't get to that place without a record like Demon Days. Now, again, with this record, as Jamie and Damon decided to embark on another Gorillaz excursion, uh, they really wanted to move past the idea that this was just a whole gimmick, a clown show of sorts, and that meant upping the ante on everything Gorillaz had to offer. That certainly happens. I think Damon does a better job of finding his own voice as 2D on this album. The production is leagues more colored and playful and creatively leans into Gorilla's cartoony appeal in such a way where the beats sound very hyper-specific to this project. Somehow the songwriting is a lot better too, as well as more melancholy and just uh, more emotionally dynamic, as now Gorilla's could be a serious vehicle for substantial pain, uh, also social and political commentary, such as on tracks like El Manana, as well as Every Planet We Reach is Dead. But really the bread and butter on this album are its countless and numerous bangers. The first full song on the album is Last Living Souls, which is this perfect balance of despondence and quirk. The following Kids with Guns brings a different groove to the table that is lazy but also entrancing. Love the plucky bass, the tinny rhythm guitars, the deflating synths. Meanwhile, O Green World has these killer, stiff, punchy kicks and snares, cheeky bleep bloop synthesizers as well. The whole thing sounds like a musical picture of a laboratory or a space station. The vibe is pure gorillas, though I could simultaneously see the very, very, very huge Danger Mouse influence on this beat as it does sound alike to something he could have been producing uh, for the Danger Doom record around that point. Dirty Harry is known and beloved for its fiery and distorted Booty Brown feature toward the very end, but it's really the big group chorus of vocals across the track that uh, really sells the whole thing and the way it endearingly and lazily follows along with the uh, synth leads and chunky beats. Then Feel Good Ink, legendary single. Uh, loads of ink has been spilled on this track. <laughs> I'm not even sure what I could add to it at this point. So many iconic elements of this song. Uh, True Goy the Dove sounding completely unlike himself, just out of his mind. That laugh, that verse, that performance, the bass line, the amazing and fantastic way the instrumental transitions into this gorgeous, sparkling bed of instrumentation on the hook that feels so disconnected from everything else, but simultaneously, I couldn't imagine anything else going there. Thanks to the MF Doom feature on November Has Come. Uh, that track has pretty much become one of the most legendary Gorillaz tracks of all time, though again, I can see very much how this kind of would be like a uh, Danger Doom extra uh, in a way with, uh, you know, some additional vocals from 2D in the mix. And look, it works. The smooth vocal harmonies from him are fantastic. Meanwhile, Doom is in top vocal and lyrical form with his trademark delivery and a conversational writing style. The track all alone is incredible, just 
just merely for its multiple, uh, very fragmented phrases that somehow work together in harmony. Martina Topley Bird's vocals on that fantastical uh, string breakdown on the bridge are just amazing. Then there's Dare with Sean Ryder of Happy Mondays fame, which uh, is easily one of the best dance tracks of the 2000s. The pumping beat, the fat growling bass, the acoustic guitar chords, the way those falsetto vocals match up with Ryder's it really goes to show how much dance music is about balance, just having a great roster of sounds and having a solid recipe. Then we have another bold vibe switch up on Fire Coming Out of the Monkey's Head, which sees Albarn and company trying to land the record in sort of a meaningful space. I feel like if we didn't have this final leg of the album, it would be easy to kind of cast it aside and categorize it merely as just being kind of goofy, weird, but fun, ear candy. But no, the band uh, really tries to drive a message home with uh, some voice acting from uh, actor Dennis Hopper. Again, another very strange and odd inclusion, but he adds so much to the song, uh, which is essentially this cautionary tale about uh, not living in reverence of the earth, but living to essentially exploit it. The following track, Don't Get Lost in Heaven, reinforces a lot of the same similar themes, but with a different sound. Kind of a dreamy 60s sunshine pop thing, but there's something slightly off-putting and awkward about the singing and instrumentation on it. And purposefully so, as I think the track is uh, essentially trying to communicate uh, some feelings uh, in regards to our impending dystopia and materialism, as well as uh, succumbing to propaganda that keeps the destructive corporate greed machine going. That vibe is also reinforced by the gigantic choral performance on top of a, a very nice reggae instrumental on the final track here, which ties up the record very nicely. These last several tracks really fuse the whole thing together really well. And that, in a nutshell, is this incredible, cartoony, unique, amazing, catchy, well-produced, and thoughtful album. Those are my thoughts on it. What are yours? Let me know. Transition, have you given this album a listen? Did you love it? Did you hate it? What would you rate it? You're the best, you're the best. What should I review next? Hit the like if you like. Please subscribe and please don't cry. Hit the bell as well. Over here next to my head is another video that you can check out. Hit that up with the link to subscribe to the channel. Anthony Fantano. Music of forever.